Hey everyone, it is Eric with Ruckin HTV, and I'm here on the second video explaining how I took my hobby, which is making diecast trucks and farm equipment, from just being a hobby that provided a little bit of income up to a $30,000 a year part time income or part time job for uh, plus a hobby. So that was a lot of, that was, I mean, that's kind of cool because not only was I uh, getting to do what I love doing, but I got to get paid while doing it. So I'm going to wait just a couple minutes here for people to get on the show today, and then I will dive into uh, the meat of what it is that took me from, you know, being kind of, I hate to say this, but I'm not, I wasn't upset, but just not having any fun at, at, at building models, you know. I was selling some stuff, it wasn't fun, it was... Uh, it was kind of tedious. Uh, some of my clients were, I mean, I was attracting the wrong clients. <laughs> That's basically all it was. Uh, there was a number of things I wasn't doing well. And I explained that yesterday in the first lesson, uh, or not the lesson, but the first video of how I got about this, telling you what I did wrong. But today I'm going to tell you what I did right and really what launched me from uh, just playing around with it into doing something meaningful. So uh, we'll get going here in another minute or so. Um, yesterday in the video I explained that uh, one, I was, wasn't was specific enough. I was doing too many things. I had poor pricing. Um, I was being vague in general and and that all changed. And it happened uh, really, uh, it, was a, it was an evolution, but one of the big kickers was in 2014. So Hey, there's Matt. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Carson's on. Good to see you. I know it's lunch hour for a lot of guys uh, across the country, so thank you for being here and taking a few minutes to be a part of Rockin' Age TV. And you, some of you guys, I've known you for a while, and it's uh, good that you're here. I appreciate the support. Also, if you like what you're hearing, give me a thumbs up. Tell me I'm on the right track. And if you don't like it at the end of the show, make sure you leave comments in the comment section. Uh, anything you want to... Uh, talk about is is on the table I won't be offended so that'll be great uh, hey appreciate that Dylan thank you for the uh, thank you for the thumbs up appreciate that and Matt good job appreciate that all right well we've got a uh, small audience but it's mighty and that's okay I know it's a lunch hour let's go okay so uh, we're gonna do video two and what we're talking about is everything that I did right to take my hobby from just something I was playing with into a meaningful business that generated some fun income. I mean, uh, I'm talking about the gross income, 30K, but not the net, and, and that's all right, but uh, here we go, right? So yesterday I talked about what I didn't do right, today here we go on what I did uh, better and and took steps to, to make it better. So here we go. Um, 2012, as I explained yesterday, I launched what is known as Rock and H Farm Toys, and that included, in all in the same year, I, I uh, launched my website, uh, www.rockandhfarmtoys.com, my Facebook page, uh, and also my YouTube channel, all under the same brand. And then you would see the same branding across all three platforms. And one of the reasons I did that is I was I still listen to this guy named Pat Flynn with SmartPassiveIncome.com. And um, and he had a policy of being everywhere, and and I really didn't appreciate what that was. I just did it because I figured he was doing what I wanted to do, and so I just copied what he's what he was doing. All right, so that's kind of how it came to be, and uh, so that's that's kind of what I, my policy was: be everywhere. So I chose, like I said, YouTube, Facebook, and and then my website. And I didn't understand it then, but what I understand now is, and, and I've mentioned this on a couple of other message boards on Facebook and stuff, is that because I was in these different places, Google, which is very important, Google says, look at this guy with Rock and H. He is in three different places. He has a blog that he's posting to regularly. Uh, Facebook, there's activity there, and there's a YouTube channel this is a legit, legitimate place, okay? That's important because um, I started putting keywords in, all the metadata, and tagging all my posts correctly, and doing lots of little things in the background that nobody ever sees, but to Google, they make a big deal because when you're sitting there searching for 
uh, double combine trailer, a single combine trailer, custom truck, guess whose photos, guess whose blog content shows up in the top 10 of those searches. A lot of times it was mine and I'd either be in the top 10 or the top three. That's a big deal and that was a smart move. That, that mindset still works, okay? So, now you just can't start all these things up willy-nilly and not contribute and make a, and, and add content to them regularly. And when I said regularly, even once a week is enough. You have to be committed to doing that on a regular basis. Now, I'll admit I've let my website slide quite a bit because my interest and are changing and uh, what I'm wanting to do is changing. That's okay. But just keep in mind uh, that policy still works. Okay, so pick platforms you're comfortable with and then use the heck out of them regularly. Contribute to them. Make a difference. So that's one thing that I did and I recommend those of you wanting to make a difference in your business do something similar. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, another thing that I did, and it was kind of by accident, and this is this kind of bleeds into what I'll talk about tomorrow, but um, I was reading lots of blog content and reading books and things regarding attracting good clients and getting good customers. And over and over again, a lot of these people doing what I wanted to do, they said, pick your customer. Pick who you want to sell with or sell to or, or work for, okay? In your mind, and, and I had this very distinct picture in my mind of who my ideal client was. And I've said this many times in different conversations I've had online and in videos and things like that is, my ideal client is custom harvester, a guy that works for that custom harvester, and um, and I included some farmers in there, not all of them, but people, particularly farmers that were proud of their trucks, because they do exist out there. So those three people, and the, and the custom cutters primarily, were who I wanted to work for. One, I loved what they did. You know, I was just living vicariously through them by making their their vehicles and then getting paid to do it, which was oh, crazy cool. Um, and two, they have money. Now, not all of them wanted to spend money on a custom truck, but generally, those are the kinds of people that understand the value of quality. They don't want to do it themselves, and uh, they're willing to pay for it. And as long as you keep make promises and keep them, by golly, they show up over and over and over again, okay? So that is who I, that's what I did. So in my mind, I even had, uh, you know, I've met custom harvesters and I would have a picture in my mind of people I'd met and I'm like, that's, that's who I'm selling to. That's who I'm talking to. So when I'd write a blog post or I'd post photos, I'm thinking of that person as the person I'm going to sell to next. Okay. I always had that picture in my mind. I mean, I kind of, you know, I, in my mind, I thought they drive brand new pickups every year. They have really sharp vehicles and semis to pull their equipment all the time. They, uh, you know, they go out for maybe not fancy dinners, but they, when they do spend money on a nice meal, they go to a nice place and they enjoy nice things and they have, you know, not top shelf equipment all the time, but they have really nice stuff. And that's who I was thinking of and that's how I was acting. And on the uh, guys that work for Custom Cutters, uh, in my mind, when I'm thinking of that guy from England or that guy from Missouri or Mississippi coming out to Kansas or Texas and cutting wheat all summer long, I know that guy's here for a very short period of time. And he, when he goes back home, he wants to point to that model that I made for him and say, hey, guys, that's the truck I drove in 2012. And I went from Montana to Texas and back again with this outfit. And that was the greatest summer of my life. Do you see the language there? That is so key because that guy didn't buy a toy. He bought a memory. That's what he bought. Right there was a memory, and that's on his shelf forever. See, so that's that that was huge. That transformed one of the things that transformed my business and made a huge difference. And I see Mark Ham, he's here on the call too. He's doing these custom uh pulling tractors for uh, these race, uh, you know, racers and, and different people in his circuit. That's exactly what they're buying. 
they're not buying a toy. They're buying a memory. They're buying a piece that they're going to point to and say, I did that. And when they're talking about it, their faces are going to light up. Their friends are going to be jealous and say, Ooh, ah, where'd you get that? Do you see what's happening there? That's what you need to recreate in your small business. And, and I guarantee you guys, when you start thinking that way, the people you sell to will change. You're not going to have to worry about bad clients. You're not going to have to worry about people nagging you for updates all the time. The whole thing changes and it will be a blast. I mean, there will be days when it's not fun, but it will be a blast, I guarantee you. So, okay, I've hit that hard, but it's just desperately important. If you're wanting to take your hobby to something meaningful, that's these are two things you have to do. Okay, uh, three, you need to add value that costs nothing. Okay, now I'm using my phone or I'd pick it up and show you, but when I was building... Uh, vehicles, uh, when I'm building vehicles for people, I'm taking pictures of them showing it being built. Okay, what does that mean? It means they can see it come to life. It means they know you're working on it, and when you say, you know, I ran into a snag, here's what's the problem, I hope to have it rectified in seven days, it's taken a little longer than I thought, guess what? You just bought time, and they're not going to ping you for a message saying, you know, it's been 10 days, I haven't heard a thing, where yet, are we on track, blah, blah, blah. Because there are guys that they just, you know, they need that that amount of touch. That's one of those things I did, was just send them photos. <laughs> it doesn't get any easier than that. You have your phone with you anyway, likely. Just post it to Facebook and say, hey, buddy, here it is. Or send it in an email. Hey, quick update, here you go. So there you, that's, that's one of the things I did. Uh, add value that cost you nothing. Um, you could create a certificate of authenticity saying, uh, you know, this is, um, you know, one of one exclusive models for Bob Jones on his birthday from his wife, you know, some sort, some sort of, if it's for his birthday or an anniversary gift or a wedding present or or maybe it's just something they commissioned you to do and it's a replica of something they had. You can say this is one of one and there will never be another one just like it. Cost you nothing except a little time and some ink out of your printer and a sheet of paper. Done. You include that with your uh, with the model when you ship it to them or hand it to them and guess what? It, you, you just added value that costs nothing. And this goes into what we're going to talk about tomorrow on pricing. Okay. All these little things, all this touch adds value to it. It just makes it worth more, okay? <laughs> and it may sound corny and crazy, but it works. And uh, something I used to do, but I didn't really see that I was getting much traction out of it, I would even uh, wrap up a ribbon around stuff, you know? Uh, you know, I'd wrap it up in bubble wrap and then just take a red ribbon or something like that and wrap it up, just, you know? You could throw in a piece of candy saying, you know, it's sweet to do business with you. I mean, I know it sounds gimmicky and corny, but if it comes from the heart, it works. I mean, that's something you're doing. I found the best thing to work for me was the photos and videos of, you know, doing a live video showing them, hey, I'm working on your truck tonight. Hope you enjoy watching this thing come to life. Here's how it's made. <laughs> Didn't cost me a thing, right? But it does add value. So whatever you can do to add value that costs you nothing is what you want to go for. And however that works for you, whatever that looks like, is your deal. Make it specific to you, something you can repeat, and something that's easy for you to do. And something you genuinely care about and you want them to have, okay? Because if you don't care about it, it ain't going to work. It'll just fall through. The, it, it'll fail. So you have to uh, care about it. I kind of touched on this briefly, but over-communicate. And, and when I say over-communicate, I'm not talking about a long paragraph of information. Just a quick message saying, you know, the decals are late. It's going to be five days. My decal man is off the, you know, on a vacation. I didn't order him soon enough. You can buy a lot of time if you just say, I goofed or something broke or, you know, we're right on time. Just quick update. All of those makes a difference. And, and I will tell you this too. Um... 
doesn't I don't do that perfectly every time. I'm sure if you would go down my client list and you you'll find one or two say, well, you know, you didn't ever contact me. I didn't do it perfect, okay guys, but I did try very hard to be consistent and do as good a job as I could. Sometimes, you know, you just you don't do the job as well as you want of all these little things that you're trying to do. But if you do them often enough, regularly enough, the mistakes will be well outweighed by the ones that came to the top. So we have a comment here by Paul. He says, the only problem I have is that the item arrives broken. I've seen the video that you did on packing, but it's, sometimes it still arrives broken. Sometimes I think people break them just, oh, <laughs> yeah, you can't help the, you know, I've had very, very good luck. Uh, it, it either, it, if something breaks, people either don't tell me or uh, they've just been really cool about it. And they say, hey, it broke. And I say, well, great. I'll do two things. I'll tell you how to fix it or you ship it back at my cost and I'll ship it back to you my cost and it'll be fixed. And it works. It works. I had that happen last year on a $2,500 deal. Uh, the corner of a box got crunched and a bumper was busted up by the time the guy got and a wheel broke off of all things. I said, okay, guy. Send it back to me. I repaired it, fixed it up, sent it back. There you go. And, uh, you know, I was out of $15 shipping. So my policy on anything broken is if you want to fix it, I'll help you. If not, I'll do it, and let's get it in the mail and get this thing turned around. That's the way I did it. Again, that costs you very, very little, okay, going back to things that add value cost you nothing, okay, this costs very little in shipping to get this thing turned around and it adds value to the product. So when your client is saying, well, you know, Rock and H sent me this thing, it's busted in the mail, but you know, he told me to ship it back and he sent me 10 bucks for shipping and, and uh, you know, I had it in a week. So, I mean... That's the kind of, those are the stories you want your people to tell. And uh, this is, and that whole thing, what I just said kind of reminded me of something else um, that I've said in the past and I, and I kind of made a mistake not telling you now, but this kind of goes back to the beginning of this particular video. This is something I've, I've, I've preached and something I, I live by when I'm building models and stuff like that. So your model is sitting on your client's uh, mantle or desk or, or curio cabinet or on their layout someplace. What story do you want your clients to tell about that model? Okay? Get in their head, okay? And I've already mentioned this a couple of times uh, throughout this, this show is, you know, I, I have a friend in England I've made everything he's driven since 1984 when he visits the States. I went to his wedding this year, and when he's looking at his models in his curio cabinet in England, I want him to tell his friends when they come over, see that? I drove that in 1984. That's the Anteater, and it's, <laughs> it's a 2 plus 2 uh, international with a green card. I drove that Anteater, and it was so heavy it lifted the front of that truck. Remember. He's looking at models, but he's telling the story from 1984. That's what I want my clients to say. I want my clients, when they look at that grain truck that they drove with their grandpa, do you remember grandpa and I? We drove, uh, we, we drove that to town, and, and that one time the, you know, the tarp wouldn't on, or the tarp blew off, and we had to struggle to get it back on. Oh man, do you remember that? It was so cool. Do you hear what I'm saying, guys? The models aren't telling us, the model itself is just a model. But you're giving that client the opportunity to relive a point in history that they loved. You're taking them back in time to a, maybe, you know, you remember when we got stuck and Grandpa chewed us out? You know, those types of things that, you, that were bad back then, but you laugh about them now? See, you can't put a price on that. You cannot put a price on that. And that's what makes your models when you start doing these things worth more than the guy that doesn't have a story if he's not encouraging his clients to relive that when they see that on their desk they're not going to be able to get as much money out of it it's not just about money but it is about you getting compensated well for your art and doing a good job 
uh, producing something that means value. Okay, so um, we've hit that off pretty hard, and I have got... Um, okay, um, this is something that kind of comes up in different groups. It's a negative thing, but it doesn't have to be. And here's what it is. If you make your clients promise, keep it. And if you can't keep it, tell them. Be honest with them. As simple as that. You know, I've told a few guys, it's like, you know, I'll give this a try, but I'm not sure I can get this done. And it may stink at the end, but I'll let you know. And if you, and here's something else I, I told my clients. I said, you know, especially on something that I doubted my skills or it was new or something I just didn't, wasn't familiar with, but I still wanted to give it a go. I would tell them, it's like, here it is. I'm going to put this together. It may suck. And if that's the case, I'll send you pictures and you're not committed to buy it. But if you do want it, here's going to be the price. This is what it's going to be. You know, and then through that process, I would let them see again the evolution. You know, this this is good. It didn't quite turn out the way I'd hoped. It's close. It's not perfect. What do you think? And then put it back on the client. And oftentimes to say, well, you know, we get it. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way, but we love it. Send it on. You know, or, or one client I told her, it was her husband's, uh, he did a three, he had a 379, um, oh, one of those kit trucks where you have to buy the engine and training for it, whatever those are called. Anyway, the decals for the battery box were terrible. They didn't show up. They bled right through. You couldn't see them. And these were high-end decals. And uh, I said, here it is. The decals kind of did what I thought they'd do. They're terrible. What do you think? And she's like, you know, I get it. Send it to me. I want it. And and that and it works. So if you make a promise, keep it. And, uh, you know, not every time are you going to be able to fulfill that. Sometimes you're going to just fail. Don't be too hard on yourself because I've done it. Don't be too hard on yourself. Cut yourself some slack and just continue to work on being consistent and making great stuff and, and it'll pay off in the end. Okay, and then another thing I did, and I don't know how everyone handles this, but something that I kind of figured if I'm going to charge you three, dollars $400 for a model truck, then it's my job as a professional to get the bid right. So when I laid down the bid, I never came back and asked for money, more money. So if I if I overran or I didn't buy something right or something came in just a little over budget, I kind of figured that's my fault, not the client. So when I set it down, when I when I told them the price, I said this this is the price, this is a lock. Now if you come back and add to it, that change that's a game changer. You know, if there's some sort of change that, that's going to be significant, then that's a game changer. But once I tell you the price, and for this item, the way you describe it, this is it. And, and I think that, well, that was just something I did that I think, again, added value that didn't cost me any money. And there's a few times that I never lost money, but I, there's a few times I sure didn't make very much because uh, just weird things happen and, uh, yeah, you know, all those things. Any of you have done this for very long, you get it. Some of those things just happen that the overruns and... I could list a million things, but none of them come to mind. So there you guys go. That is about five different things that helped me turn my hobby into a part-time business. Uh, I mean, I, was, I usually work 20 to 30 hours a week on my business. You know, a lot of weekends, early in the morning, and sometimes in the evenings after kids went to bed or activities were done. You know, you send off a few email messages over the lunch hour. I'd go home, throw down some lunch, spray a little paint, and then go back to work. Excuse me. <laughs> Lots of little things like that that made a difference. But that's how I did, that. that's some of the smartest things I did uh, when I built this business was just all of those little things. You know, my YouTube channel, website, Facebook. Um, I chose my customer, so, you know, the electronic stuff, choose my customer. Um, add value that cost you nothing, and you know, let me see, I kept my promises, and then didn't ask for more money. So those are some things that I did that helped me. I mean, I built it, in my opinion, reasonably quick, no longer than, I was, than I've been in it. So uh, hopefully some of those will help you. Now, don't take all of these at once. 
take the ones you can use and use successfully, put those into practice, and then go out and do something amazing with your, with your model business, okay? So that's all I have for you today. If you like what I've said, please leave me some feedback in the comment section if you agree or disagree. It doesn't matter. That's fine. Uh, or if you have better ideas to share, please do so. It'll help someone else and keep the conversation going. And um, that's all I got. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about pricing. And it might be a short video, but um, I'm going to tell you why I did what I did and the results of. Okay? So there you go, guys. Thank you for joining me for a little bit here on your lunch hour. I will talk to you again tomorrow, and we will see you next time. Thanks for all the feedback. Catch you later.